Welcome to a Legendarium special about Galba, the Emperor who overthrew Nero. In the comments section, please let me know whether you think Galba deserves to be remembered as a good Emperor or a bad Emperor. Galba was born on December 24th, 3 BC, the son of a consul named Gaius Sulpicius Galba and his wife Mumia Achaea. According to legend, when Galba's grandfather sacrificed an animal, an eagle snatched the intestines from his hand and carried them to an oak full of acorns. The old man then made a prediction that his grandson Galba would do great things. Indeed, later in life, Galba took such pride in his family history that as emperor, he displayed a copy of his family tree in the imperial palace. Along with the great wealth and the ancient lineage he received because of his birth, the young Galba also enjoyed the favor of Augustus, Rome's first emperor. According to the Roman historian Suetonius, Emperor Augustus singled out the young Galba. Supposedly, Augustus told him, You too will taste a little of my glory, child. Though a precocious youngster, Galba had no relation to the ruling dynasty, so the prophecy seemed unlikely at the time, if it even happened. However, Livia Augusta, the wife of Augustus during his youth, adopted Galba and helped him advance into Roman ruling circles. He began his political career before the normal age, yet proved himself to be an ambitious and hard-working youth. Though he married at some point during his life, his wife and children both died before he could ever see his grandchildren. And so Galba may have coped with his grief by hurling himself into his work, becoming praetor at the tender age of 23, consul at the age of 35, then receiving command of the Upper German Army during the year 40 AD. In one of his greatest achievements, Galba created a display where elephants walked across ropes in front of the awestruck Roman public. When Emperor Caligula died, many tried to persuade Galba to take his place, but he refused. Instead, Galba allowed Claudius to take the imperial purple. Claudius understood that Galba posed no threat to his power and made him a much trusted advisor. Claudius even appointed Galba proconsul of Africa, and he served in Africa during the years 44 and 45 AD. Wherever he served, Galba showed himself ruthless and uncompromising, leading with harsh discipline. He often refused requests for furloughs, kept his men working hard even in peacetime, and once starved a soldier to death for selling army grain rations to the highest bidder. Yet ruthlessness to Rome's enemies walked hand in hand with unflinching loyalty to the ruling dynasty. After the death of Claudius, Galba proved his loyalty once more by choosing to enter semi-retirement rather than compete with Nero for the throne. Suetonius suggested that Galba's unattractive appearance might have made him appear less threatening and therefore more trustworthy. The historian described Galba as a man of medium height with no hair, a hooked nose, and a heavy-set body disfigured by arthritis and gout. Yet he gained a taste for extravagant living, never going anywhere without a second carriage laden with one million sesterces in gold. In 60 AD, Nero ended Galba's semi-retirement by making him governor of Nearer Spain, and he served in that post for eight years. According to Suetonius' history, Galba showed himself stern as ever. Among other things, he cut off the hands of a corrupt moneylender and nailed them to his counter. Galba also ordered the crucifixion of a man who poisoned his ward to obtain the ward's inheritance. When the poisoner protested that a Roman citizen could not be crucified on such a cross, Galba pretended to relent and instead moved him to a taller and more brightly painted cross that befit his high station. In 68 AD, Galba led another gruesome campaign against rebels in northern Spain. While with the army, Galba learned that the Emperor Nero plotted his assassination. With no choice, Galba accepted and perhaps 
prompted an invitation from Vindex, a governor in Roman-ruled Gaul, to lead a rebellion against Nero. He then recruited an additional legion in Spain and built up a large following in many other regions of the Western Empire. Vindex himself, a loyalist to Nero, suffered defeat in a battle with the Rhine armies, which cleared the way for Galba. The Praetorian prefect, Gaius Nymphidius Sabinus, encouraged the Praetorian guard in Rome to desert Nero in exchange for a large reward, and on June 9th, Nero finally did a good service to the empire and committed suicide. This marked the end of the Julio-Claudian dynasty, which ruled Rome for more than 80 years. Joined by Otho, the governor of Roman Gaul, the 70-year-old Galba marched on Rome, and the Senate proclaimed him emperor. Galba's attempt to cut back Nero's extravagant spending proved unpopular. The Roman people hated high taxes and spending cuts aimed at paying for Nero's wasteful spending. They especially resented Galba's rejection of gladiatorial games as a waste of money. His execution of hundreds of troops recruited by Nero proved little more popular. Galba's victims included Lucius Clodius Macer, whose revolt against Nero in Africa cut off Rome's grain supply for a time. In short, he showed his usual harshness in dealing with the empire's enemies. Yet, a priggish commitment to good government ensured that Galba would not reward those who helped him take power. First, Galba refused to pay the Praetorians a donative, a polite word for a bribe, that his allies promised during the uprising, and in their anger, the Praetorians assassinated Galba's ally Nymphidius. Another blow came when Galba rewarded the legions that supported Vindex rather than him, as if Galba wished to infuriate all his allies. This enraged the upper German legions, who actually fought for Galba against Julius Vindex, who, and they then refused a customary vote of loyalty to Galba. Alba. Soon enough, they joined the legions of Lower Germany in declaring one of Nero's flunkies, Vitellius, their new emperor. To win back the Senate's support, the widowed and childless Galba made the son of a noble Roman family, Lucius Calpurnius Piso, Another gesture of good government, aimed at ensuring a peaceful transfer of power from one to the other in the event of his death. Yet... Galba would have been wiser to give that honor to Otho, his loyal ally during the rebellion against Nero. This only infuriated Otho and spurred him to take the imperial purple for himself. Unlike Galba, Otho offered the Praetorian Guard what they wanted, a large bribe. I mean, donative. Galba and his heir Piso went ahead with planned sacrifices in the Roman Forum on January 15, 69 AD, despite the usual warnings from soothsayers. Galba refused to wear armor, and while walking to the place of sacrifice, Galba saw a group of horsemen. By most accounts, he understood what would soon happen, and meekly bowed his head and ordered the soldiers to do their duty which, of course, they enthusiastically did. According to legend, the furious Otho asked to have the severed heads of Galba and Piso brought to him on a platter, and with little further ado, the Praetorian Guard declared Otho their new emperor. The historian Tacitus famously wrote of Galba, It was everyone's opinion that he was capable of ruling the empire had he never ruled. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.